I was hanging out at the chicken coop, uh, looking at their little silky chickens, which were really these like beautiful fluffy chickens. And I heard this shout of, hey, a dinosaur. And <laughs> I turned around and some of the children had lifted up the low branches of a giant um, spruce tree. And under those branches, they discovered this this dinosaur um, as, you know, looking back at them. and. I, this article came out of the, um, the, the kind of awakening about, um, you know, children, the beautiful thing about discovering places with children is that they will discover things you wouldn't even think to look for. It never would have occurred to me to get down on my hands and knees and lift up the branches of that tree, you know? Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and that was my dear friend, Darcy Kitching. Uh, Darcy is based out of Boulder, Colorado, and we have a conversation about her doctoral program that she is finishing up, her dissertation, and some of the research that she is doing at the intersection of uh, children, uh, children's health, well-being, and the transportation systems. And then we also talk a little bit about uh, the Boulder Ramblers, the uh, walking group that she helps lead there in uh, the Boulder area, and a really cool event that's coming up where they're gonna be walking around the entire circumference of the Boulder City Limits. Uh, it's right around 25 to 26 miles in total. And that's a super fun event that I tagged along with last year to film. And we also talk a little bit about the whole concept of reframing how people view streets and the streets are for people movement. So without further delay, let's get right to it with Darcy Kitching. I'm so delighted to have with me here today, Darcy Kitching from Boulder, Colorado. Darcy, welcome to the podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. Yay. Thank you, John. It's delightful to be here. Yeah. And I say welcome back because you've been on the podcast before, but this is the first time uh, on the video version. So yes. yay, we have visuals. <laughs> it's a little different. <laughs> uh, although, you know, for, for, for those folks who are very familiar with the, uh, the Active Towns YouTube channel, uh, there are a couple of videos out there with you. And we'll have a, a couple video clips from that because uh, last year uh, I helped out by filming uh, your yeah. Walk 360 event. And we'll yeah. talk about that, too, because that's coming up uh, rather soon as well. But why don't we right. do this uh, to kick us off and to sort of get us get our mojo up and get us moving? Uh, why don't you just take a, a, a few seconds to, you know, uh, explain to the audience who Darcy Kitching is? OK, well, that's a question I often have myself. But <laughs> <laughs> um, so I am I live here in Boulder, Colorado, and for the last seven years, I have been um, kind of in charge of and leading a group called the Boulder Ramblers. We were established by a cooperative called Walk to Connect that's based in Denver, but is actually all over the world. And I started uh, leading this group, the Boulder Ramblers, and just got really excited about the possibilities of doing community urban hiking, walking, adventuring. And I am an urban adventurer, if nothing else. All my life, I have loved cities and travel and um, exploring and discovering places. And so that led me into my kind of academic life, which um, is grounded in both uh, education and urban planning. So my first foray into figuring out how to put all these great passions for adventure and travel and all that together um, was to really understand human development and how environments, uh, how we are shaped by our environments. So how does human development and the built environment um, interact? And I was always really interested in that because I had a consciousness of being shaped by the environments of my childhood. So I went into that and then I explored down that road a little bit further. I got into the whole child-friendly cities world and got into child-friendly cities research, um, got an urban planning degree and um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I've been walking and exploring. I've lived around the world. I've done work for UN Habitat in Nairobi, Kenya. I've lived in New Zealand. I mean, I've, I've been all over the place and just really um, 
excited about and interested in how we shape our environments and how they shape us. And so that's kind of the the thread that has carried me through all these years. And it has been a lot of years. It's been about 20 years yes. that I've been in that world. Um, but for just this past chunk of about seven years, really um, diving deeply into my own community, working with people, uh, walking with people, working with the city to help uh, transportation planners and other um, city employees understand how people experience the environments that they've created. So um, all of that, I mean, it all to me, it all goes together in a very clear thread, but sometimes it's hard to explain to other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the research that you're doing in the child uh, friendly cities work, and, and, but you're a mom too. I have a nine-year-old son. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, that's great. And so that's, that also helps kind of shape that paradigm and that perspective as, as you know, you talked about urban exploring, you're frequently out <laughs> urban exploring and, and all that. And you get out yeah. on the bike too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I have a turn HSD, which I love, and it has really, um, helped facilitate some adventures with my son and I, and it's great. I have the captain's chair on the back so he can just sit on the back and enjoy. And I love, my favorite thing is that when we're riding the bike, I mean, he's still, he's nine now and I've had the bike for a couple of years, but he'll still go, we, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> riding on the back. Cause it's just, it's a lot of fun. It is. It is such a, a lot of fun. It's great stuff. Yeah. So, um, that's a great little o- overview and, and you and I have known each other for, for several years and we've had the opportunity to, to do various projects together. Um, it's been fun watching you kind of get excited and re-engaged with your studies. Uh, so I think what I'd like for us to do is to kind of pop on over to there, pull up some of these visuals and have you walk us through, um, kind of the, the, the framework between, you know, the, these tools that you're using with the, uh, this study and, and, and sort of the framework and what you're really thinking about. Um, and this is part of a dissertation, right? Yes. So I started this process a long time ago and, um, thought I would go in a different direction. So I kind of let go of it. And, In fall 2020, I decided to pick it up again because the timing was just right. There was a professor in the department that I had left um, who really resonated with where I had always wanted to go, but I hadn't had quite the support or the right um, the right team to help me get there. And so now I'm working with um, Carrie McCarowitz. And she really emphasizes this nexus of, uh, it's kind of a a triangle, um, the nexus of housing, transportation, and public education. And that was always my, my thinking, how these three kind of sectors go together and how, um, all of these things influence the ways that we move around, the ways that the, the places that we're able to to be, and how um, human development happens. So, um, what we're seeing here, so now, so my dissertation study is about um, community generated data. Basically, what I'm interested in is understanding the difference between the information that transportation planners uh, and people who develop programs to help people walk and bike to school, like Safe Routes to School, um, the information that they typically use or that they have been using over the past, you know, 20 years, and um, and information that families value. Um, this includes, you know, the, the students and the adults and families. So I'm teasing apart the student and adult voices, which is a contribution because that's usually not done. Um, so my it's a three phase study. And the first phase was interviewing transportation professionals all around Boulder County. So I'm doing a regional study um, in Boulder County, Colorado, and um, looking at the differences between a school district where walking and biking and um, active transportation are very much supported by full-time employees and programs, and the other school district in the county, which doesn't have that same investment, but then also the municipalities around the county and what they're able to do to facilitate youth and family transportation. So I've been working with the Boulder County um, Youth Transportation Program Manager. She's amazing. Her name is Cammie Edson, and she 
she's really sponsored and supported this study. I feel really lucky because the county is invested in this work and in understanding how people not only use our transportation systems, but also what are their visions? What do they need? What do they really want? What's um, inhibiting them from using our transportation systems, um, specifically transit and walking and bicycling? So um, we know that Boulder County, like a lot of very suburban counties, is a place where people drive a lot. And driving indeed has come out as the top mode of transportation in my study. But one of the um, methods that I'm using is this amazing method developed by James Rojas from um, Los Angeles. He developed a method called Place It. And that's what we see here is one family's model of um, their ideal or their perfect trip to school. Now, what I, I gave you a couple different pictures of these models because they really illustrate different um, ideas and different needs. So I'll start with this one actually, and then we can go back to the other one because what I, um, what I, in, in fact, go one, one more picture ahead to the, the, there we go. So this is what we give people. We just lay out on a table a random assortment of junk. And it's truly junk. I mean, it's just stuff that you would recycle. You know, it's like old, it's hair curlers. I mean, not necessarily old. These are clean items, of course, but like right. hair curlers and um, pipe cleaners and little blocks and bits of foam and springs. There's actually a place here in Boulder that I love. It's called Art Parts, and it's often used by teachers. And Art Parts is the place at Superstore. <laughs> I went there <laughs> and I collected like, um, you know, silk leaves and flowers and these springs and corks and all that kind of stuff. So I just like amassed this amazing array of things. And I actually borrowed the bulk of the materials from Growing Up Boulder, which is our wonderful program here in Boulder that works with young people from birth to age 18 to understand how they navigate their environments and how environments can work better for, for them. Okay. So I partner with Growing Up Boulder as well. And um, so this is just one of the methods that I'm using in my research, but I think it's a really significant one because what we get, this is how we start. So working with the communities, um, I'm doing small group interview sessions where um, I'll lay out these materials. And it's the first thing that we do together where um, it's like an icebreaker, but it's also a way for them to touch into their values and their memories. And James Rojas really emphasizes the importance of doing that to bring people together on ideas for the environment. Sure. So when we start with our memories and we start with our values and our visions, and um, we're able to do something with our hands to be really creative, it brings out a whole new set of ideas. And so this is what we do before we go into the more logical and rational part of the research which is a um, map-based questionnaire. So that's where I really drill down into how do you actually travel? Um, I'm really interested in, you know, the data that people have and then what people actually do, you know, at, on a day-to-day -day basis and how that's really variable. For families, we know that they're not necessarily doing the exact same route every day, that their days are incredibly diverse. And so I'm, that's what I'm really trying to get at in my study. Um, but I'll tell you about what we've discovered through Place It because it's really fun. So we lay out this array of just random materials. Now go to the next, um, the former picture. Yeah. So the first exercise that we do is we ask people to remember um, and to build a model of their first transportation memory. So it can just be a memory of being mobile in your neighborhood. And a lot of what we hear are memories of, you know, being outside, being on a bike, um, walking, and especially immigrant families. I've worked with a lot of um, families who've immigrated here from Mexico and other places. And they, those, those moms who grew up in Mexico and other places, um, really have these vivid, beautiful memories of walking to get milk for their family or walking for recreation with their family. Um, and also bicycling comes up a lot. Interestingly, for a lot of the youth, um, I've heard more kind of danger stories like being injured while moving around outside or something like that. You know, sometimes it's a little bit surprising that being outside can be kind of scary for some kids or that their first memory of mobility is of being hurt. Um, 
Um, but that's not that's not the majority. Um, what we usually hear are these joyful memories of um, being free, being out, being around nature. Nature figures very prominently in these conversations. Um, but our second part of the exercise is what's shown here. And that's when I ask family groups to work together and to model their ideal school trip. So this could be going to school or coming home from school. And we hear basically two different types of ideas. Um, one is a totally fantastical idea where it's just something that could never happen, but is really a vision. Right. Um, and the second type is just basically an enhancement of their current experience. So this picture, you wouldn't know it. And that the narrative part of this exercise is the, is the meat of it. It's the real heart of it because people are just building with these random materials and you don't know what they're making. They have to narrate the story. Right. So what I heard from this family, it was two boys and their mom. And the boys described how um, they want to walk out of their house and get on a giant trampoline. And they, they jump on a series of giant trampolines all the way to school. And at school, there's a giant foam pit that they can fall into off of the last trampoline. <laughs> so what you see here is the series of trampolines and um, on the way to school. So... Um, <laughs> That's, that's who wouldn't one want of, to get to school that I, way? Come on. Exactly. Who wouldn't want to, right? <laughs> and so, so giant trampolines. Um, I've also heard uh, a zip line. You know, mm -hmm. I want to take a zip line directly from my house to school. Not or surprised. I want to take, <laughs> exactly, right? Or I want to take a hot air balloon or a helicopter. Or I want to fly on the back of a dragon. I mean, I've heard all of these ideas and more. Um, but what when you hear those, John, what do you think of? What do you uh, hear as the common theme there? Well, I, I hear fun and adventure. Yes, yeah. fun, adventure, but also that direct and easy path, right? right. Mm -hmm. People over and over again, when I ask them to drill down, so they communicate this fantasy and then I say, okay, so what's that really about? What's your current experience like and what would it be? Um, how, how would it be better? And everyone, almost everyone drills down to, I want it to be easy. I want it to be direct. I want it. I want to avoid all the traffic, right? right? I want to go flying over those arterials that are real borders and boundaries for me. Yeah. I want to be able to um, leap over those scary streets. And right. so I hear that over and over again. Now yeah. go to the next picture. So this is an example of the second type of story that I hear a lot, which is really just an enhancement of their current experience. So this family has the ease and the good fortune of being able to walk to school already. Mm -hmm. So they already walked to school, but this model shows all the other things that they want on that trip. So they want to have, um, uh, they already get to walk through on a pretty uh, nature filled path. And a m minority of families in my study have had that experience where they're already able to kind of go the way that they want to go. Um, but they want to have, this family said, we want to have um, a coffee shop and always have really good snacks and treats along the way. We want to meet all of our friends. We want, we want there to be like dogs and animals that we can see, but we want it to be safe. Like the dog should be on leashes and um, there should be really nice water feature so that it's like a beautiful sound as we're going through. And um and one of uh, there's a little you see a vehicle there on the popsicle stick path. One of the um, siblings wanted to be able to rent a go kart if he felt like it. Like, oh, I could just get in a go kart and we could go that way too. But we'd all still be together, you know. So we'd still be moving actively. But I could be in my go kart. My sister could be on her roller skates, um, and we'd have food. And this little boy said, um, really ideally, our favorite restaurant, which is an all you can eat. Italian restaurant would also be on this path. So on the way home, we'd stop at the all you could eat Italian restaurant and get all the food that we want. So, um, so what's fascinating about these stories to me, and what's so beautiful about using this method is that this is data. I mean, these stories are data. We usually don't think of qualitative information, narratives, stories as useful data to the planning practice, you know, the, the exercise of doing planning, because the question becomes, well, okay, so somebody wants this, 
And, you know, how do you do that for everyone? How do you create policy out of that? But what we're, what we can drill down to with the stories is really the heart of the matter. It's people's values. It's the way that they experience boundaries and um, barriers. It's the way that they want more community. And people just speak to this over and over again, nature, community, um, ease. And these are things that we can actually, um, we can build into to planning practice more conscientiously. And in my work with schools and thinking about education, housing, and transportation together, you know, these are sectors that are so siloed and are not often communicating with each other very effectively. Um, and through my work, I really hope to bring that those those pieces together better through methods methods like this, where people are sharing, they're excited, they're happy, they're having fun, and they can talk with decision makers and come to some new um, some new concepts, some new ideas. And these are the kinds of things that um, planning and design professionals have been working on for a very long time. This is not a new idea. It's just that we still. Um, have a hard time integrating them into policy, and so I hope to, I hope to um, to be doing that with with my work and to really drill down. So that's also why I pair this exercise with the map based questionnaire because there you're getting the real kind of rational, logical answers that planners recognize um, as legitimate data in a different way. But by starting here, I believe, and I and I I know that I'm getting better data in the second part as well. Um, so anyway, so that's that's what we're doing with Place It, and it's a lot of fun. I'm having a great time with this research. Uh, so far, I've worked with 110 individuals in 43 families all over the county, and that was really my target. I had a limited amount of funding. I'm, I'm um, rewarding people with gift cards to do this work, so um, that's been really effective. And um, that's another element uh, that's come out in the study, the importance of treating community members as consultants as true informants and really um, respecting their time and not just, and going to where they are, of course. I mean, we know that we have to do that. We know that we have to go where they are, that we have to respect their time, reward them for being part of the process and treat them like um, the knowledgeable people that they are. I mean, right. and like I said, we're doing that with both students and their parents. And typically in these conversations about active transportation to school, it's really just the parents who are providing the information um, and filling out the survey or whatever. And by, by teasing apart the student and adult voices, I'm getting richer data. I'm getting a deeper understanding of the, the different priorities and values that students and their parents have. And um, hoping that and that leads to the capacity for greater policy making and plan making and and program development um, down the road. So phase three of the study is then to take this data from the community back to the people I spoke with in mm -hmm. phase one and say, what do you think about this? And I've already done that with three of my um, interviewees from phase one. And they are all really fascinated by by what I've learned. And it's, um, it's, it does give us more of the kind of psychological input, the, the idea about how are people making the decisions that they're making. Um, you know, if we really want to have more active towns and more people using active transportation, we have to understand that whole decision process. We have to understand their thinking. We have to understand the timing and the expense of what they're um, dealing with currently. And so that's, yeah, that's what I'm aiming to do with my study. And it's, it's really fun. And I'm, I'm delighted that I've had the opportunity to do this. I've gotten um, a fellowship and some grants to do it. And so I'm really grateful for, uh, for the opportunity. And to be working directly with Boulder County has been fantastic. Fantastic is right. Um, so uh, what's the next step? Where, where are you at in, in the process? And, and where do you see this going? Yeah, so I will be writing all summer <laughs> and into the fall. Um, I hope to have a good draft of my dissertation finished this fall. Okay. Um, and I plan to graduate next spring. Uh, so a year from now, basically. And um, boy, from there, who knows? I am looking, you know, I'll be looking for opportunities, but I'll also be trying. I can see so many papers, <laughs> even a book that could come out of this because it's uh, it builds on um 
the work of others who have uh, done great work in this area, including people you've spoken with, like Tim Gill and Jeff Speck and others who are talking about child friendliness and walkability. Um, you know, there I, I feel like more of us doing that work is a is a net benefit. And, um, and I'm, I'm gaining insights into a different aspect of, um, of people's lives than, than they have as well. And so I hope that it will be um, a compliment to, to their work. And um, yeah, and just a, another part of the great global child-friendly cities um, database, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I can see so many directions that this work could go. I mean, one part of it is just map skills. Right. You know, it's so interesting how people, young people especially, have a really hard time locating their lives in space in a map. And, um, you know, that that has a lot of implications. And, you know, we use these tools like Google Maps even to take a bike ride. You know, what, what, what's the route that I'm going to follow or to find, the, um, find a, a walking path or whatever. And, you know, Google Maps always has us oriented to where we're going. And so we don't necessarily know where north, south, east, east and west really are anymore because right. <laughs> yeah. nobody's looking at a hard map, you know. Yeah. So I've spent a lot of the time in these workshops just helping people orient and find yeah. Um, the places in their lives. So that's been interesting. So two things, you know, come up. Uh, one is going uh, to Tim Gill and uh, a few of the things that you were you're talking about there really reminded me of my discussion with him. And that is yeah. uh, the discussion around uh, engaging kids uh, to influence design. And it's wonderful that you were able to, you know, you're capturing, yes, the parents, but you're also capturing uh, the, you know, the, the children's, you know, perspective and what they're wanting to see or their desires, their, their dreams of what their environment, you know, could look like. So that, that really resonated, uh, you know, quite profoundly with me. So that's cool. Great. Yeah. The, uh, the other thing that, uh, you know, comes up is, is of course, this, this concept of, of fun and whimsy that you know, comes with that. And, yeah. and I think that that applies, you know, uh, no matter how <laughs> old your child is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so uh, this is just from a few days ago, right? Or, or relatively oh. recent. Yeah, this was on Sunday, just a couple of days ago. Um, we so with my group, the Boulder Ramblers, mm -hmm. we are gearing up to walk all the way around the city on our slow marathon, our 26 mile slow marathon mm -hmm. in June. And so um, I'm helping people prepare for that by walking half of it at a time and just other kind of long distance walks. And so we did the western half of the Walk 360 um, on Sunday. And this is one of my favorite parts of the walk is this um, um, the swing, which is in that um, strip between the street and the sidewalk on this really nice, you know, street, 6th Street in Boulder, where um, there are good detached sidewalks, it's quiet, there are lots of big old trees. And some people use that, you know, right of way to create an invitation for people to come in and, and play or yeah. discover. I mean, little free libraries are also in this kind of space. Um, there's one across the street from this swing. And so while I hopped on the swing, some people went and perused the little free library and other people took a turn on the swing. And I, you know, it feels like flying. You could just hop on this thing and, um, and go for a little, a little flight to get off your feet for a minute. But these are the kinds of invitations that I've always really emphasized in my work with the Boulder Ramblers and with Walk to Connect. And in my, uh, my trail guide, uh, the Best Urban Hikes Boulder, um, I really tried to pick up on those, um, places that do afford fun and um, and just experiences of beauty, experiences of, of um, whimsy and delight, because that's what compels us to get outside in the first place. You know, I mean, not just our own need for exercise and, um, and fresh air, but what keeps us going is what we discover. And I've, I've always really tried to emphasize that. So whether it's a mural to look for or a really interesting garden or little free libraries or um, art pieces or swings or whatever. And I, I've emphasized that in my work also with Growing Up Boulder. Um, I wrote a 
piece for them uh, a couple of years ago called Where Are the Dinosaurs? And <laughs> that really comes from this uh, time when I was out with a group of first graders going on a walk in their neighborhood and discovering these things that I had already discovered, which included like a really um, artful and cool chicken coop and um, which is really neat. Oh, yeah. Okay. So you've got the, <laughs> thank you. Um, so if you scroll down, you'll see some of the things that we discovered. And uh, so it was this awesome group of English language learners, um, first graders. So this is one of the maps. Um, and you can see here is another swing um, that I found on this walk. So I went out there, right? And I pre-made this map. And I said, okay, we're going to go on a walk. We're going to discover these things. But I want you to keep your eye out for other things I might not have noticed. And what, you know, what do you get out of this, right? What do you notice? And so we went along and we did this. And they appreciated what I had found. But in a way that I could never have predicted. Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see what they found. So they, I was hanging out at the chicken coop, uh, looking at their little silky chickens, which were really these like beautiful fluffy chickens. And I heard this shout of, hey, a dinosaur. And <laughs> I turned around and some of the children had lifted up the low branches of a giant um, spruce tree. Right. And under those branches, they discovered this, this dinosaur um, as, you know, looking back at them. And I, this article came out of the, um, the, the kind of awakening about, um, you know, children, the beautiful thing about discovering places with children is that they will discover things you wouldn't even think to look for. It never would have occurred to me to get down on my hands and knees right. and lift up the branches <laughs> of that tree, you know, as adventurous as I am and as I think I am, like that's not one of the things I would have chosen to do. But because they did that, they discovered a whole other layer of interest in that environment. So what I try to encourage in this article and in my work generally is for us adults, and especially us adults who consider ourselves professionals and uh, in the design professions and we're creating places for other people and we're enhancing places for other people, we, we shouldn't lose sight of that um, opportunity to create or to invite um, fun, whimsy, discovery, and have little kind of pockets of places that can also invite other people to leave their invitations there for others to discover, right? Um, and people have put up these swings in that, you know, th that uh, strip um, in the right of way, just of their own accord, because they want to have a creative and friendly, inviting neighborhood. So the neighborhood where I was walking with those kids is um, part of old, the old historic downtown part of, of Boulder around Whittier Elementary, which is this beautiful old school building. And, um, you know, it that kind of place, when you put one invitation into it, more just seem to evolve. They just right. seem to spread sprout up because you're creating an environment that invites creativity. And when neighbors start doing that, people just build on it. And that is beautiful. And I want more and more and more of that. Honestly, if I do nothing in my life, then just encourage people to create creative, artful, beautiful, human development, enhancing environments, I will have lived well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and this is actually a, a, an invitation that we ran into uh, and saw oh, yeah. <laughs> during our walk. And so uh, go ahead and narrate this. What's going on here? So we're walking down a, um, a multi-use path. You can see someone just biked past. Um, and outside of this house, um, on the on the left they always have something cute and whimsical and cool and th this time they had left out a box of sidewalk chalk and so i picked it up and i wrote life at three miles per hour which is our motto uh our kind of hashtag and drew a heart around it because why not <laughs> of course <laughs> That's one of the reasons I just love this opportunity to get out and discover and explore because yeah. you just, these things happen, right? And I, I come back from that experience of walking 26 miles around the city, just so alive, enlivened and um, delighted and others do as well. And what a, what a beautiful thing yeah, to be able yeah. to do. 
And we're, we're actually at about 21, 22 yeah. miles at yeah. this point. Let's turn the volume up on this. Okay. One of those wonderful tree tunnels that always feels refreshing. Right, yeah, so yeah. Here it's 3.30, close to 4 p.m. And this is such a cool corridor that just makes our afternoon. <laughs> Cools us down. And like it's you said, yeah. yeah. And like you said too, it was like it was such a gift too to have like somebody leaving chalk yeah. out, sidewalk chalk, so an that invitation. you could do that. An invitation. These communal, community, and neighborly invitations are such a fun part of what we discover on this route because we go through so many different kinds of neighborhoods, and it's fun to see how people engage each other, right? And what they want to give to the community and how we can contribute back. Right. Yeah. Love it. It's so funny because, <laughs> you know, you, 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 you had been talking about the invitations and, and so I, I had already planned on playing that clip anyways. And so it was perfect. You, you served right. it right up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, obviously this is something, you know, this is a recurring theme, right? Yeah. This is just yeah. something that I, it's, it's what I really value. And yeah. so I was so grateful that you were able to be there with us last year. That was so much fun. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about uh, this year and, and, uh, and, and the process. It's going to be earlier this year. I think it's probably going to be normal time this year, right? Right. So okay. last year, the city of Boulder had shifted um, their walk and bike month plans and celebrations to September. Okay. Just because, I mean, the, the pandemic knocked everything off course, right? So right. Uh, in 2020, there was no walk and bike month at all. Uh, then they shifted it to September, but just to, you know, allow for a little more space between the the bulk of the pandemic and, you know, what looked like the end at that time, right? right. It looked like yeah. it was the, yeah. <laughs> the end of it. It looked like it was raining. <laughs> oh, it did. Um, and now we, the, the city went ahead and um, put Walk and Bike Month back into June, which is what it has traditionally been for the last, you know, 20 odd years. So we are hosting the Walk 360 on June 18th. Okay. And everyone is really hoping for a nice cool day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you, you, you mentioned day. cool day because uh, it was one of the hottest days yeah. uh, last year. So, yeah, yeah, it was. And that's hard. You know, yeah. it's hard to walk all day when it's hot, <laughs> even when you do have those lovely, lovely tree tunnels and things, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, I, I just queued this up just to play in the background a little bit, um, especially yeah. because we're going to get started out onto the trail and, and there's some nice images. Talk a little bit about what it's like to bring this group along, because uh, you, you, you kind of like you had mentioned earlier, you're starting to do some training for this and so because you really want the group to have a, a good experience on the day of absolutely that's the key is to engage people who are capable of walking 26 miles um, in one day but also encourage people to challenge themselves to do so and in our community we have um, you know people ranging from you know their 30s to their late 70s and um, I really try to help people work up to being able to do the walk 360 and um, and you know if people just want to do half of it that's okay too but on the full day, when we do the full 26 miles, I try to um, curate that group and um, make sure that everyone is, is up for the whole day. So, um, so on these halves, like we did on Sunday, uh, we walked this direction on the western half. And um, that was enough for some people. And um, we'll do the second half uh, in another couple of weeks. And then we'll do the whole. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. And there are many different ways to to, to walk this route. It's, um, it, we used to do it in quarters as well, but because of just like pandemic and carpooling and all that stuff, I stopped doing that. But right, um, yeah. so, because when you do the half, you can easily take the bus back to where you started if you need to. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's great. We have this wonderful bus that just goes down the spine 
uh, of Broadway, and that connects the two places where we stop on the two halves. So that's yeah. that's kind of perfect connector. Um, but yeah, otherwise, it's just it's a wonderful day where we get to discover all the different types of walking and hiking surfaces in the city, from dirt trails to alleyways to um, streets without sidewalks and sidewalks and multi-use paths and all of that. Yeah. Uh, and it's just, it's a great adventure. Yeah. So this is our group. We're now pretty much just a meetup group. So now that Walk to Connect has dissolved. Uh, so yeah, that's, but yeah. we're going so strong. In fact, let's let's talk a little members. bit about that. So, <laughs> so the uh, Walk to Connect used to be a co-op and now it's sort of just this collective and really yeah. uh, what, what that sort of means is that the collective members are, are listed here and we'll be sure to have all these links in the show notes uh, and, and in the video description down below. Um, but yeah, so, so now at least for the Boulder Ramblers group, you, it's, it, it always was sort of organized through this meetup and yeah. you're able to, uh, you know, do this. And, and I was noticing almost 2000 people as part of this, uh, meetup, this membership. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever imagine that it, it would grow to this, this level? I mean, how, how impressive and, and, and just kind of awe-inspiring is this? Oh, it, it is. It's amazing to me because when we started in 2015, um, we, it was really started by the founder of Walk to Connect, Jonathan Stalls, and he got it going with the city. And then because I lived in Boulder and I was volunteering with Walk to Connect, it just made sense for me to take it over. And it has been going so strong, but we had like, you know, a uh, hundred people or something in the group for a while. And then that, I mean, that qu it quickly did grow to about 500. But, you know, we have this kind of core group of maybe 40 people <laughs> or, or 40 to 60, maybe who kind of circulate. And then we get new people every now and then. So a lot of, you know, the bulk of the kind of members of the meetup are people who are kind of just watching it or um, touching it every once in a while. And, but there are people who, who support it and who are, um, eager to see what we're doing. And that's exciting. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's been so much fun. We've just had a, an amazing, you know, I went to a party the other evening, and I was blown away because everybody I knew at the party yeah. had met the host through this group. Ah, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. You know, and, and it was really the bulk of the people there. So right, that the right. host of the group had made <laughs> all of these great friends. Right. Um, the host of the party had made all these great friends through, through Boulder Ramblers. And it just warmed my heart because I've seen that, you know, a couple of people have walked the Camino de Santiago in Spain together. Ah, okay. um, there have been, you know, a variety of different kinds of just, you know, um, you know, romances and other things that have come out of the Boulder Ramblers. And it's just, it's so exciting to see people getting to know each other. I mean, that for me was my main um, motivation was how do we just get to know our ourselves, our neighbors and our places, you know, together. Yeah. And that's, um, I mean, that's really what it's all about. And it's that kind of three part motto that Walk to Connect always had, which was connection to self, connection to others and connection to place. Yeah. And we do that on these adventures. And some, you know, sometimes they're not more than about three miles long. And sometimes they're all day, you know, so we, we run the gamut. Uh, so there's something for everyone. Yeah. And I paused on this uh, particular uh, image here of uh, the, the Boulder Ramblers doing the Boulder Boulder. Yeah. <laughs> and, and sometimes you go out and do it with 30,000 other friends. <laughs> well, exactly. There you go. <laughs> so we're going to meet up in our walking group at the at the back of the, the Boulder Boulder on Monday on yeah. Memorial Day. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got like 20 people who are going to do that. So that's yeah, great. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. that's so much fun. So <laughs> the... We've talked a little bit about um, your your research and, and the work that you're doing there. And we've talked about, uh, you know, the Walk 360 and the Boulder Ramblers. Talk a little bit about, you know, because I think both of those touch upon one thing, and that is uh, this concept of streets are for people and Absolutely. safer places. Talk a little bit about um, that and and why you're so passionate about that. 
Yeah, yeah, and you should show the picture of me when my streets streets are for people shirt. It's, it's coming up. <laughs> With, yeah, good. So, um, right, and I love I love that you've uh, really taken that up as a motto as well because it's I mean that's what it's all about. It's it's about and it's not about you know um, there should never be any cars anywhere, right? But it's it's like Jeff Speck says you when you create a place that is um, walkable then you're creating a place that actually facilitates all kinds of transportation in a much more effective and efficient way. So, um, right, so here I am <laughs> in my Streets Are For People shirt uh, on a recent Boulder Ramblers walk. And um, somehow I had never noticed this sign before, and maybe it's new, but um, it's on a street called Calmia, where somebody has declared that it's a shared street, which is great. And I think, I mean, I think it probably is according to the city as well, because they've put some um, some uh, infrastructure in there that has, has narrowed the street a bit and has made it a little more um, calm. And, well, and if I remember um, that that part of Calmia, there, there, there's no sidewalks. And so right. de facto, it is a shared speed. Space. It is, it it is, is a, a shared, shared street. street. Yeah. Exactly. And, but it's just a reminder to cars yes. that you're going to see, you know, people and animals. There are also right. like wild peacocks in this area. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of different wild animals through there too. And so it's, it's kind of that, it's a wonderful, um, part of the street that really is welcoming. We could just walk down the middle of the street, no problem. Um, so that to me is a strong value because we need, not only do we need places, we need streets that are safe because that's where we want our children to be able to congregate. That's where we want um, people to be able to meet th with their neighbors and um, have, you know, informal events, get togethers, um, and just move through there in a way that they know that they will be safe. So, you know, Vision Zero and other um, recent kind of programs and, and policy action have really taken up that concept that um, safety means that a street accommodates all the modes um, effectively. And that means slowing down cars, making sure that there's sufficient space for um, walkers, sufficient space for bicyclists and people using other small wheeled devices like skateboards and other stuff like that. Um, you know, we have to be able to accommodate all the users of streets uh, moving through cities or else we just have dead we have dead streets, you know, like Charles Marone talks about that, right? You have a you have a strode where people are not welcome and they're going to get hurt if they try to cross that that road. Uh, so true streets, true roads. <laughs> so those high speed corridors are, are necessary and important. But where there are concentrations of people and the bulk of our um, our urban environment really should be uh, streets that accommodate accommodate people. Well, urban and residential. So, well, that's, yeah, that's what yeah, I mean. Yeah. 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 For, yeah. for sure. And, yeah, and this is a, a common theme that you know, comes up time and again um, here on the podcast is that um, many of our streets um, are shared environments uh, one way or the other. And so it, it is incredibly important to, to, you know, have that paradigm that, you know, streets really are for people and we need to be, you know, thinking about how we can reinforce those slower speeds as you just uh, mentioned there. And yeah. it, it gets back to the um, the thing that we were talking about earlier, though, too, is um, the visioning that that the kids had of getting to school. It's like without having that friction, that friction and that scariness of, you know, the, the crush of cars and waiting in traffic and, 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 you know, that drama that takes place, you know, ar around the school zones. And, uh, I was so delighted to hear Will Norman bring that up in my interview with him uh, in London about the School Streets program. Yeah. Talk a little bit about, you know, your framing and, and, and how that kind of fits in with some of the research that you're doing and, and some of the things that you're you know, advocating for there locally from a, a safer streets perspective. Yeah, well, I love the school streets approach, the concept of just truly closing down streets um, to cars 
at certain times of the day, you know, in front of schools. I mean, this is something that we hear from school administrators as well is, you know, a lot of principals are really deeply concerned about the cr- the crush of traffic. It's, it endangers um, kids. So, and here in Boulder and in a lot of places around the United States, We have this phenomenon of school choice where, I mean, here in Colorado, it's been um, kind of, you know, policy since 1990. So you can kind of choose wherever you want to send your your child um, to school based on the programs that are available. And, you know, if there's space available, there are certain different policies with different um, school districts. But generally, we invite people to not just look at their neighborhood school, but to consider the entire district as their um, as their homeschool in a way, you know? And so that's what introduces a lot of, or certainly contributes to a lot of the traffic problems um, around schools, around streets that that feed schools. Um, we have this problem of people coming in from far away. And I, you know, I don't want to knock school choice too much. There are a lot of reasons that people do it. And there are a lot of reasons that it's policy. Um, but what it has created is this phenomenon of people traveling long distances um, twice a day to, uh, to ha- have their child access a certain program or um, or a school that they deem more appropriate. So um, what we have to come up with are solutions to the externalities associated with school choice. <laughs> so right. it's like, okay, you've got all this traffic. What do you do? And what I'm hearing in my research is that the difficulty of that, the difficulty of just conceptualizing new ways to handle that. So I actually did hear from one principal, um, the school streets concept. And I said, Hey, that's cool. You're thinking of school streets, you know, do you think it would be possible here? And she said, I can't even imagine how we would make that work. You know, how would we actually shut down the streets, you know, 500 feet around the school twice a day. I can't even, I don't know what would. And then there was a parent who was in that conversation as well. And she said, oh, then you'd have to create a parking lot on the outside of that zone. And I'm thinking, no, you just let them out and let them walk across the lawn. You know, (laughs) like all that you're doing is creating more of a sort of park, you know, where you, you invite people to, um, to, to let their children travel you know, a quarter of a mile or less on their own. And for some people, that is a a big, it's a hard no for some people. And for others, it's a really difficult concept. Because we have gotten so used to shuttling our children from door to door, making sure that we can see them going into that building. There are fears of many different types. Um in our communities, you know, uh, fears for our children, fears of children. That's another thing that I've heard is high schools. I mean, of course, around elementary schools, these conversations are more possible and they're more, um, they're more readily undertaken by planners and district officials, you know, because people don't, mind elementary school kids walking down their street, right? Oh, there's this cute little kid with his backpack. Isn't that sweet? You know, we'll look out for the little, the little kids. But when you're talking about middle schoolers and high schoolers, and you're, you're looking at teenagers and adolescents, you know, going through your neighborhood. I mean, as someone who has worked in child friendly cities for a long time, and who has always been kind of shocked and astounded by, by these ideas of teenagers as menaces or troublemakers. I mean, I just, it's, it's really hard for me to conceptualize um, thinking that way as a neighbor of a school, you know, right. like, oh, I don't want these teenagers hanging around. But, but that's what the planners I've talked to have heard. So right. as they try to create more opportunities for walking and bicycling around high schools, which is another challenge because they tend to be located farther away from communities, but they're also located farther away from communities because nobody wants a high school in their neighborhood. So, I mean, there are so many, um, it's, it's a very complex um, world of school siting 
and the access to those schools, um, bus routes, uh, path networks, all of these things. It's, it's a really complex thing, but that's where I hope to spend the rest of my career is trying to de disentangle these notions of people's fears and values, their needs, um, the access that they have to the resources that they need, the access that they have to the things that they want, um, how do we then invite activity as part of those daily journeys? How do we invite activity in a way that people um, can welcome into their community? And, you know, so we heard, right, we hear over and over from people, from students and parents alike, fun, we want fun, we want nature, we want to be separated from traffic, we want to make sure that um, that we have amenities along the way. Why not? You know, here I am thinking, oh, we could just have, you know, food trucks and like all these great things just out on this wonderful path system and it, everything is rosy, you know, and, and these things take a really long time to develop and they take a long time for people to come around to. And so that's, I don't know, I just, it's, it's so complicated <laughs> and I wish it weren't so complicated. I wish that you know, you can take one piece of this, like, I've always really appreciated Jeff Speck's work, because he's like, you know, walkability, that's the thing. And honestly, I, I was in that world. And I appreciate that. And you can, you can highlight walkability. And as you've said before, you know, uh, it's just one piece of the puzzle. And if you want to specialize in that, that's great. But here are these people who are biking and here are these people who are driving and here are these people who are taking buses and who want, who want micro mobility and other right. amenities. I mean, there are lots of different options and opportunities out there these days, you know, with, from scooters to mini electric shuttles, you know, there are all kinds of things that people are asking for and wanting. And that's another thing actually that we've heard in the research is um, parents who are driving because they, have to because they feel like they have to for whatever reason. Right. Um, they see the same people in that line of cars every day. And one parent said, why can't we just have a shuttle that would pick up kid, you know, where I could drop off my kid, and then it would take all of these students, you know, to the school, and we wouldn't have to drive in front of the school. And so I mean, people are thinking about the alternatives that we might be able to create. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, where, like that parent said about, oh, you'd have to have a parking lot on the outside of the zone. Well, that's what comes up is instead of thinking of just dropping off and then letting my child have this, this next link in the route himself or herself, I then have to be part of that whole process. So yeah. part of it is disentangling parents' fears. Part of it is really creating environments that are monitored inviting, you know, that's another thing that comes up a lot is more adult presence in the environment. Um, if we just had crossing guards, if we just had, um, if the PE teacher could just come and pick people up, you know, in some places I've seen that, um, where uh, a school official will come to a designated area and then walk with kids to the school. I mean, those are, I mean, there are all kinds of great ideas out there. Yeah. I mean, when you think of all of the the different sort of initiatives is what I call the software programming. You know, we, we talk a lot about the hardware and in, in terms of, you know, the pathways and the bike lanes and the parks, and these are activity assets that are hard hardware, but the software are the programming, you know, the walking school bus and the, uh, and being able to do a bike train, you know, and pulling together, you know, yeah, we're, we're going to make it a thing. We're going to make it an event. And this is a programming thing. And, and, yeah. uh, you know, other, schools have have implemented a thing where yeah the 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 parents will will stop let their kids out you know several blocks away and then walk in and sometimes it's yeah. a group activity and and every parent doesn't have to you know go with their child they can do it together and so there's yeah. some programming things that can be done one of the things that keeps coming up in in my mind is how we sort of help people reimagine what streets are for. And uh, so I'll, I'll be coming back to, to Boulder. I'll be back yeah. in uh, the, the end of August. 
Oh, great. Uh, and so I'll be there to uh, film, once again, the Open Streets event in Fort Collins. And so that's mm-hmm. on uh, August uh, 28th. So it's Sunday, August 28th is, is the Open Streets event up there. And the reason why I love to show up to film those types of events is it helps reinforce that concept of yeah. reframing what streets are for. Um, and I think that that's just it, because... It's so important that we yeah. do realize <laughs> that, you know, it's the, this reality that we have that is, you know, that we've evolved into of streets are for cars is is a relatively new construct. It's, you know, streets oh, have been right. around for thousands of years. The automobile has only been around for a little more than 100 years. And so yeah. understanding that our streets is, you know, that these are the arteries that are the lifeblood of a community. It's, as Chuck yeah. Marone likes to say, it's the platform for building wealth and vitality and vibrancy yes. in a community. And it's the majority of public space. Yes. I mean, these are public assets. Streets yes. are public assets. And they shouldn't, you know, in, in both of our thinking, they shouldn't yeah. be restricted to vehicles, right? They should be, they should be flexible, yeah. And um, invite a variety of, of types of activity. I love that Fort Collins is doing that. As you yeah. saw, I mean, I commented in something that one of our one of our planners here in Boulder posted about a great open streets event in some yeah. other location, and I yeah. said, "Hey, <laughs> how about Boulder? You know, how are we going to make this happen in Boulder?" And he's like. I think he responded where there's a will, there's a way. And and I was like, all right, there's definitely a will. (laughs) So you and I, John, you and I are going to make it. There you go. In fact, I'm going to, I'm going to pan out on this particular image so that we can see that all, you know, all of the, the wording, because it it literally says, you know, you know, I think DK said, yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. And then in here, this is, uh, you know, we're, we're all in this together. And, uh, and and I do think that that I would not be at all surprised if that's part of your future is, you know, helping bring some of these things to life in, in your community. Absolutely. So. I am so committed to that. And yeah. and as I hear these uh, comments and interests in my research, I mean, it just it just reinforces that that yeah. passion um, for creating not just events, you know, open streets right. events, which are fantastic and which I definitely want to facilitate, but also just reimagining, really reimagining together yeah. the um, the assets and the opportunities that we that we have. I mean, we have this incredible network of public space. Yeah. Well, and, it's not it's not about the event. It's 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 right, about it's, yeah, reframing yeah. and getting people to see that you know, totally. hey, shouldn't every day be like I feel like the streets are for me? So. Right, yeah. right. And and there are various initiatives like, you know, the Green Streets Movement and things like that, which are really trying to um, to create more networks of streets that are for people, truly. Yeah. And I hope that we can do more and more of that. I mean, there's always community pushback because people are afraid that it's going to lengthen their commutes and whatever. But um, but we have to help people reimagine um those not only those places, but also their own needs and yeah. their own patterns, and um, and create you know and as we see from people like the Bruntlets and you know in uh, the Netherlands, like you when you create these environments for people, people adjust. I mean, we are our species is nothing if not resilient and adaptable. Yeah. I mean, we adapt to our environments and when you create an environment that says this is how this is what you do here that's what people do there (laughs) so i that's we just have to get over our fear of of the pushback and and as people as things change you know people resist change and it's like we can help them reimagine and and have a better life how do we create better quality of life by creating places that invite certain types of movement and um, really making that the norm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm so glad you gave uh, uh, Chris and Melissa a nice little plug there. Uh, their new book, uh, Curbing Traffic, is is really a reflection, right. their personal <laughs> reflections of what it was like to, to move to a, a, a 
a nearly car free existence, a nearly car free city in as in uh, Delft there in the Netherlands. And so it's a wonderful book. If you haven't seen that yet, uh, folks, be sure to uh, uh, be sure to pick up your own copy of uh, uh, Curbing Traffic uh, published by Island Press. Darcy, it has been such an absolute pleasure and a joy, as usual, having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, John. It's been a delight. Thanks for all you do. Thank you all so much for tuning in to this episode with Darcy Kitching. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up. (laughs) Leave a comment down below and uh, please do share it with a friend. Uh, It really helps to grow the movement uh, when somebody passes it along. And uh, and, and maybe share it out on social media. That's a a wonderful way to share it within your networks. (laughs) And uh, if you haven't already done so, please, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel and be sure to hit that notification bell so that you can customize how you'd like those notifications to come to you. And a quick reminder about my two study tours that I have coming up, uh, both in Colorado and in the Netherlands. So I will be heading to Colorado and I'll be there at the last week of August, uh, August 28th through September 3rd, September 4th, uh, attending two events, the Open Streets event in uh, Fort Collins and also the Tour de Fat event in Fort Collins. Uh, Super fun events. I've been to them before. I've profiled them. I'll be sure to include a a link to a video that uh, profiles uh, that Open Streets event. And I'd love to have you come along. I'm going to be meeting up with folks in the Denver area, in Boulder, and also up in Fort Collins, looking at the infrastructure that they've been putting in place in the last few years and what they have planned for the future and how they're handling some of the challenges, uh, including maintenance of pathways and and streets in a snowy environment. So uh, if you're interested, uh, be sure to shoot me an email at john at activetowns.org and ditto with the Netherlands trip. That'll be the end of October. We'll be attending the International Cargo Bike Festival the October 27th through the 29th. And then we'll be doing some study tours of the various cities in that region and looking at some infrastructure, talking about programming. Uh, So if you're interested in that, again, send me an email, john at activetowns.org. And final reminder about the Active Town store, if you'd like your own Streets Are For People t-shirt like Darcy had on, (laughs) pop on over to the store. Uh, We've got some fun t-shirts and water bottles and other swag out there. And if if there's something that you don't see out there that you'd uh, like, let me know. There's an amazing number of things that they have available. So uh, yeah, just let me know what uh, you'd like to see and what you'd appreciate. And uh, we'll we'll get that uh, out there on the store. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It's always wonderful to have you along for the ride, Uh, but it's time to go. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Cheers.